this time he won their support. On August the 3rd, 1492, he set sail from Palos with three small ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Eight months later, Columbus returned to Barcelona, but not with the anticipated silks and spices from the east. Instead, he was accompanied by six brown-skinned natives bearing pearls, strange fruits, gold, and exotic birds. He had discovered an exciting new world across the sea, and the Pope declared that these rich lands belonged to Spain. The name America did not emerge for another five years. It derived from the Florentine navigator Amerigo Vespucci, who sailed to the South Continental mainland in 1497. What is almost unknown in the world is that representing Ferdinand and Isabella and the nation of Spain, Christopher Colombo should have planted the flag of Spain when he landed upon the first beach in his voyage. He should have claimed those lands for Spain, but he did not, ladies and gentlemen. He planted a white flag upon which was a green cross. Upon his return, Columbus related that he had landed on Watling Island, now San Salvador, in the Bahamas. He had also visited Hispaniola, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, and Cuba. Ferdinand and Isabella were delighted, and their hero was offered a seat at the Spanish court. His second voyage, 1493 to 1496, took him to Guadalupe, Antigua, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica. The third voyage of 1498 saw Columbus in Trinidad and on the mainland of South America. Then, in 1499, the colonists of Haiti revolted against his command. Consequently, a new Spanish governor was installed, and Columbus was shipped back to Europe in chains. His last voyage in 1502-1504 concerned the coastal exploration of Honduras and Nicaragua, but despite his hour of glory, he died in poverty two years later at Valladolid, and Columbus was buried at Seville in 1542. His remains were eventually removed to Hispaniola. Now this exciting piece of maritime history is well enough known, at least, you know, by a lot of people. What is not so well known is the fact that the New World discovery was no accident. You see, Columbus was fully armed with detailed navigational charts before he set sail. He knew there was land there. He had maps that showed the land. They had been drawn up on previous Atlantic crossings and were vouched for at the Spanish court by John Drummond, whose grandfather had been to America in 1398. Drummond was related to the Drummond Earls of Perth, where the records confirm that he was with Ferdinand and Isabella in 1492. Both Columbus and Drummond had lived on the island of Madeira. Drummond's father, John, the Scott Drummond, had settled there in 1419 along with Columbus's father-in-law, Bartholomew Perestrello. John, the Scots' father, was Sir John Drummond of Stobhall, Justicier of Scotland. Sir John's sister Annabella was the wife of King Robert III, Stuart of Scots. Sir John's own wife was Elizabeth Sinclair, whose nephew, William Sinclair, was the founder of Roslyn Chapel. Elizabeth's father, Henry Sinclair, Baron of Roslyn, Earl of Orkney, led a successful transatlantic expedition nearly a century before Columbus, and even he was not the first. Henry Sinclair's Norse ancestors had explored the Atlantic as far back as the 10th century. In Hawke's book of the Icelandic saga, extant copy dated 1320, Leif Erikson is detailed as having crossed the Atlantic to Wineland the Good in 999. Indeed, the Orkney sailors had reached land to the west within Henry's own lifetime. Their reports claimed that the natives of a faraway place called Est 
taught the lands, sowed corn, and exported furs and sulfur to Greenland. Estatalands was the place eventually called Nova Scotia, or New Scotland, in Canada. The Orkney sailors also told of a southern country called Drogio. The natives of Drogio ran naked in the hot winds, but across the sea the people were very refined. Their land was rich in gold, and they had cities and great temples to their gods. Now, these various accounts were all confirmed when voyagers traveled to the Caribbean islands and onwards to Florida and Mexico, the home of the Aztec Indians. In complete disregard of these early discoveries, tradition has it that the Aztec Empire was not explored until the Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés arrived there in 1519. Well, from 1391, the master of Sinclair's fleet was the Venetian sea captain Antonio Zeno. The Zenos were among the oldest families of Venice and were noted admirals and ambassadors from the 8th century. Before Sinclair and Zeno made their own passage across the ocean, Henry drew up a contract with his daughter Elizabeth and her husband, Sir John Drummond. The deed was sealed at Roslyn on May 13, 1396. It empowered Sir John and Elizabeth to claim Henry's Norwegian lands if he and his sons should perish in the expedition. An account of the Sinclair Zeno voyage is to be found in Andrew Sinclair's The Sword and the Grail, pages 108 through 150. In May 1398, the Sinclair fleet set sail. There were twelve warships and a hundred men, some of whom had made the voyage before. Their first port of call was Nova Scotia, where they landed at Cape Blomidon in the Bay of Fundy. Now, even today, the Micmac Indians tell of the incoming ships of the great god Coolscap, who taught them about the stars and how to fish with nets. On his return home to Venice, Antonio Zeno wrote that at this place he had seen streams of pitch running into the sea and a mountain that issued smoke from its base. Now, Nova Scotia is certainly very rich in coal, and there are exposed coastal seams of pitch where the coal brooks run at asphalt. Nearby, the greasy underground residues often smolder beneath the hills of Cape Smoky. At Louisburg on Cape Breton, there is a primitive cannon found in 1849. It is of the Venetian type, used by Zeno, and, ladies and gentlemen, it is of a style that was quite obsolete by the time of Columbus. From Nova Scotia, Sinclair continued south towards the land of Drogio. Evidence of the journey can be seen at Massachusetts and Rhode Island. At Westford, Massachusetts, where one of Henry's knights died, the grave is still discernible. And punched into a rock ledge is the seven-foot effigy of a 14th century knight wearing a bassinet, chain mail, and a surcoat. The figure bears a sword of the 1300s and a shield with Pentland heraldry. The knight's sword is broken below the hilt, indicative of the customary broken sword that would have been buried with the knight, the same as would laid before Percival in Grail lore. At Newport, Rhode Island, is a well-preserved two-story medieval tower. Its construction an octagon within a circle and eight arches around, is based on the circular model of the Templar churches. Similar remains are to be found at the 12th century Orphir Chapel in Orkney. The Newport architecture is Scottish, and its design is reproduced at the St. Clair Church. Corstorphine, where Henry Sinclair's daughter as her memorial. Rhode Island was not officially founded until 1636, but its founding was no chance event. At the Public Records Office in London, a text dated four years earlier describes the round stone tower at Newport. It proposed that the tower be used as a garrison for the soldiers of Sir Edmund Plowden, who colonized that area. 
Now, more than 50 years after the Sinclair expedition, Christopher Columbus was born into the high age of discovery in Europe. In Portugal, he became a Knight of Christ in the revised Templar order, as did his famous contemporaries Vasco da Gama, Bartolomeu Dias, and Ferdinand Magellan. In short, he was a Knight Templar. He also belonged to the Order of the Crescent, founded by René de Anjou, also known as the Order of the Ship. The Crescent Knights were particularly concerned with matters of navigation, but had been condemned by the Church for insisting on a very, very minor point, the point that the world was round. Through John Drummond and others, Columbus knew precisely where he was heading, and it was not to Asia. Maps of the transatlantic New World were already in existence within his Templar circle. In particular, he had access to the new Globe of the World, which was completed in 1492, precisely the year that he set sail. This globe was produced by the Nuremberg cartographer Martin Behaim. He was a navigational business partner of John Afonso Escorichio, better known, better known, ladies and gentlemen, as John Drummond.